بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والعاقبة للمتقين ولا عدوان إلا على الظالمين وشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له إله الأولين والآخرين وشهد أن نبينا محمد عبده ورسوله المصطفى الأمين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك عليه وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد so today is the 23rd day of the reading and the commentary of this book of Tafsir Tafsir al Karim al Rahman fi Tafsir Kalam al Mannan more famously known as the Tafsir of As-Sa'di, by Shaykh Abdul Rahman ibn Nasir As-Sa'di, who died in the year 1376 of the Hijrah, rahimahullah ta'ala bi rahmatihi al-wasi'ah. And today we begin with the first surah of the 30th juz of the Qur'an, and it is the 78th chapter, Surah Al-Naba, and it is known by this name in a number of the books of Tafsirs and in a number of the narrations that you will find from the generation of the Tabi'een onwards for what it was more famously known as in the time of the companions and in those ahadith in which it is mentioned from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam is Surah Amma or Surah Amma Yatasa'aloon and both are very similar in names because sometimes the first verse is mentioned in, in, in its complete form and sometimes part of the first verse is mentioned and obviously as we mentioned before this is more akin to a description as opposed to a name and the companions often used to re- refer to surahs in this way by mentioning to you the opening verse, Surah Amma, Surah Nun Wal Qalam, Surah, this is how they would often refer to the surahs of the Quran. It is a Makki surah according to Ibn Abbas, radiallahu anhuma, and then those scholars who followed him in this and declared it by agreement, such as Ibn Atiyah and Al Qurtubi and others, and it consists of 40 verses. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulihi wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. اللهم اغفر لنا ولشيخنا ولوالدينا والحاضرين قال المصنف رحمه الله في تفسير قوله, قوله الله تعالى بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم In the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful عما يتساءلون What are they asking one, one another about? عن النبأ العظيم about the great tidings الذي هم فيه مختلفون concerning which they differ كلا سيعلمون nay they will come to know ثم كلا سيعلمون again nay they will come to know that is what are those what are those who disbelieve in the signs of Allah asking one another about? Then Allah explains what they are asking one another about. As he says, about the great tidings concerning which they differ, that is about the great news concerning which they differed for a long time, and their attitude of rejecting it and believing it to be very unlikely became well known. Although it is tidings that are not subject to doubt. But those who disbelieve in the meeting with their Lord would not believe even if all the signs were to come to them until they see the painful punishment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that they ask, about, ask one another about the great news or the great tidings. What are the great tidings that are being referred to in this surah? Some of the scholars of tafsir wrote the position that what they differ over and what they ask concerning is the Qur'an. That's what it's being referred to. They ask about the Qur'an and they differ over it because some of them or many of them rejected it. Well, they all rejected it, but they differed as to what it was. The sayings of a madman, some of them couldn't understand how the eloquence of the Qur'an was something which was unrivaled. So they had different issues that they had with the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's one position amongst the scholars of tafsir. The other one, and the one that the author favors, and before him, many of the scholars of tafsir, such as Imam al-Tabari, rahimahullah ta'ala, and others, is that what they differ about is resurrection. Yawm al-Qiyamah. That's what they differ about. Is there a resurrection? Is there not a res- resurrection? And the reason why Al-Tabari and others chose this position is because the rest of the surah then deals with Allah Azza wa signs in the earth and creation and then on the day of judgment what will take place. And so the context of the surah and the verses that then follow in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then answers this question about that which they differ using his signs of the universe and then speaking about the day of judgment speaks about the issue of resurrection and qiyamah and that is why those scholars said that that seems to be the stronger of the two positions, and Allah knows best. And Allah says, nay, they will come to know. Again, nay, they will come to know. That is, they will come to know when the punishment and what they used to, they used to deny befalls them. 
when they are shoved forcibly towards the fire of hell. And it said to them, this is the fire which you used to, den- which we, which you used to deny. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explains the blessings and the proof that confirms the truthfulness of what the messengers brought. أَلَمْ نَجْعَلِ الْأَرْضَ مِهَادًا Have we not spread out the earth? وَالْجِبَالَ أَوْتَادًا And made the mountains as pegs. وَخَلَقْنَاكُمْ أَزْوَاجًا And created you in pairs. وَجَعَلْنَا نَوْمَكُمْ سُبَاتًا And made your sleep for rest. وَجَعَلْنَا اللَّيْلَ لِبَاسًا And made the night a covering. وَجَعَلْنَا النَّهَارَ مَعَاشًا And made the day for earning a living, for earning a livelihood. وَبَنَيْنَا فَوْقَكُمْ سَبْعًا شِدَادًا And built above you seven f- f- firmaments. وَجَعَلْنَا سِرَاجًا وَهَّاجًا And placed therein a blazing lamp. وَأَنزَلْنَا مِنَ الْمُعْصِرَاتِ مَاءً ثَجَّاجًا And sent down from the rain clouds water in torrents. لِنُخْرِجَ بِهِ حَبًّا وَنَبَاتًا So that we may bring forth thereby grains and vegetation. وَجَنَّاتٍ أَلْفَافًا And gardens dense with foliage. foliage. That is, have we not bestowed upon you immense blessings? For we have spread out the earth and made it ready for you to make use of it by cultivating it, building uh, building dwellings on it, and taking routes throughout through it, and made the mountains as pegs to hold the earth firm, lest it shake and shift, and created you in pairs. That is, male and female from one race, so that each may find comfort in the other, and there will be the love and compassion and they will produce offspring together. This includes sexual pleasure. And made your sleep for rest. That is, so that you may seize your work, uh, seize your work, which, if you, if you did not stop, would cause you physical harm. So Allah has caused the night and sleep to overtake people so that their harmful physical ac- activities may cease and they may attain some needed rest. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions these signs, Allah Azza wa Jal asks them as questions, alam, alam, did Allah not do this? Did Allah not do that? Meaning, that it is a point of reflection to imagine what would be the case if the opposite was true. So if the earth wasn't flat and it wasn't a place where you could stand on, it was something which if you put your foot on the ground, it would sink in. It wasn't something firm enough for you to build upon, for you to travel upon, for you to walk upon. How different would life be if the mountains weren't there to stabilize the earth and the earth the earth constantly shook, constantly was moving, constant tremors, constant moving, how difficult would it be? If Allah Azza wa Jal hadn't given to you partners that you could marry, that you could spend time with, that you could procreate with, how difficult would life be? If Allah Azza wa Jal hadn't given you different times of the day and night for you to rest, for you to work, so that you could take benefit from both, how difficult would life be? And anyone that is deprived of any one of those blessings that Allah Azza wa Jal bestows upon them knows the preciousness and the value of what Allah Azza wa Jal gave to them. And, and built above you seven firmaments, that is seven heavens which are st- very strong, solid and firm. Allah holds them by his might and has made them a roof for the earth and there are many benefits in them. Hence he mentions above, hence he mentions among their benefits the sun, as he says, and placed therein a blazing lamp. It is referred to as a lamp so as to highlight the blessings of its light, which is something necessary for people and it is described as blazing, which is indicative of its heat and the benefits thereof. And all of these are the creations of Allah and the servants of Allah. Each one of them praises Allah and glorifies Allah and does as Allah Azza wa Jal commands. The sun, how vast it is. One of the greatest and amazing creations that we can see. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it subservient to him subhanahu wa ta'ala. As the Prophet said sallallahu alayhi wa that every night or every evening when the sun sets, it goes before the throne of its Lord and it prostrates in a manner that only Allah Azza wa Jal knows. And he seeks permission to continue upon its course. And Allah gives it the permission to do so. As Allah Azza mentions in Surah Yaseen, لَلشَّمْسُ يَنْبَغِي لَهَا أَن تُدْرِكَ الْقَمَرُ وَلَلَّيْلُ سَابِقُ النَّهَارُ The sun, it is not befitting that it takes the place of the moon, nor that the night takes the place of the day. Each one, Allah Azza is given to it its place. And that is why the Prophet told us, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that on the day of judgment, when that sun comes and prostrates before Allah, seeking permission to continue, Allah will say, no, go back from where you came. So it will rise from the west. And that is when the day of judgment will be established. All of these are subservient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They submit to him. And sent down from the rain clouds water in torrents. That is abundant and plentiful. 
so that we may bring forth thereby grains such as wheat, barley, corn, rice, and other things that humans eat, and vegetation. This includes all, veg all vegetation that Allah has made as fodder for their livestock. So rather than vegetation, a better is fodder. Fodder is a better translation. Allah Azza mentions both benefits. Benefits in terms of what you eat and what you consume. Benefits in terms of what your animals and your livestock eat and consume. Because you also need your livestock. Allah Azza didn't just give provision to the humans. He gave provision to the animals and to the insects because we benefit from them. Just look at the ant and look at the bee and look at all of these insects that Allah Azza wa allows to go about in their functions and we directly or indirectly benefit from them. And gardens dense with foliage, that is, gardens dense with trees in which there are all kinds of delicious fruits. How could you disbelieve in the one who has bestowed these great in, uh, inestimable, inestimable and innumerable blessings upon you and deny what he has told you about the resurrection? Or how could you use the, his blessings to disobey him and deny him and, and deny them? <laughs> Verily, the day of judgment is a time appointed. يَوْمَ يُنْفَخُ فِي الصُّورِ فَتَأْتُونَ أَفْوَاجًا the, the day when the trumpet will be blown and you will come forth in crowds. وَفُتِحَتِ السَّمَاءُ فَكَانَتْ أَبْوَابًا And the heaven will be open and will become gateways. وَسُيِّرَتِ الْجِبَالُ فَكَانَتْ سَرَابًا And the mountains will be made to vanish as if they had been a mirage. إِنَّ جَهَنَّمَ كَانَتْ مِرْصَادًا Verily, hell is lying in wait. لِلطَّاغِينَ مَآبًا For the transgressors, a destination. لَابِثِينَ فِيهَا أَحْقَابًا In which they will remain for countless aeons. لا يذوقون فيها بردا ولا شرابا During which they will not taste any coolness nor any drink إلا حميما وغساقا Except scalding water and pus جزاء وفاقا A fitting recompense إِنَّهُمْ كَانُوا لَا يَرْجُونَ حِسَابًا Indeed, they did not fear reckoning. وَكَذَّبُوا بِآيَاتِنَا كِذَّابًا and, we and, re and they rejected our, revel our revelations outright. وَكُلَّ شَيْءٍ أَحْصَيْنَاهُ كِتَابًا We have kept an account of all things in a book. فَذُوقُوا فَلَنْ نَزِيدَكُمْ إِلَّا عَذَابًا So taste the punishment. We shall not increase you in aught but, to, but, to, but torment. Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions what will happen on the day of resurrection about which the disbelievers ask one another and which the stubborn, and which the stubborn deny. It will be a momentous day which Allah has made a, a time appointed for all creatures. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about Yawm Al-Qiyam and as we said at the beginning, this is the reason why a number of the scholars of tafsir said that that is what Allah Azza wa refers to at the beginning of the surah about that which they differ and that which they question because now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will mention Yawm Al-Qiyamah in detail so Allah Azza wa answers that which they differed over they rejected and they doubted resurrection Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now tells them what will take place on that day the day when the trumpet will be blown and you will come forth in crowds and there will occur such troubles and turmoil that will turn children's hair gray and cause great distress the mountains will be moved from their places until they become like scattered dust and the heavens will be rent asunder until they become like gateways. Allah will judge between all creatures according to his rule which is never unfair. The fire of hell which Allah has prepared for the evildoers and has made it a destination for them will be lit and they will uh, remain therein for countless eons. eons. According to many commentator, commentators, uh, the word haqab uh, Translated here as eons, aeon, refers to a period of 80 years. Allah Azza wa Jalla says that they will stay in the fire, ahqaba. Ahqab is the plural of the word haqab. And it is a long, extraordinarily long period of time. And the scholars of Tafsir differed as to what it refers to exactly in terms of years. And as you can see here, 
the position of the author, what he took from other scholars of tafsir, is that each one is 80 years, meaning that they will spend a period of 80 after 80 after 80 after 80. Allah Azza wa in this way. Ahqaba, in the plural form, for as long as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala determines. And this was one of the verses that some of the scholars of tafsir used who took the position that eventually the people of the five will be destroyed and they will cease to exist based on verses like this because Allah Azza wa says that they will have ahqab. It is a number of periods, but eventually that period will come to an end and then they will cease to exist. But the majority of the scholars disagreed because they took this verse in context with the many other verses in the Quran, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that they will be in the fire and they will not die therein. So Allah Azza takes away from them death. And the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the people of the Jannah going to Jannah and the people of the fire in the fire, Allah Azza wa will call both of those groups and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will present before them death in the form of a ram and it will be slaughtered. And then it will be said, O oh, people of Jannah, for you is life and no death. And O oh, people of the fire, for you is life and there is no death. So the majority took all of these ahadith and verses together and they said this is just an expression of how long it is. 80 after 80, after, meaning once one period finishes, there's no respite. Another one begins, another one begins, another one just never ends. Keeps going circle after circle after circle for the rest of eternity. When they come to the fire, they will not taste any coolness nor any drink. That is, they will find nothing to cool their skin or to, or to ward off their thirst, except scalding water. That is, hot water that will scald their faces and pierce their bowels and pus. This is the pus of the people of hell, which has an extremely foul stench and horrible taste. They will deserve these frightening punishments as a fitting recompense for what they did of deeds and brought uh, them to it. Allah will not wrong them, rather they will have wronged themselves. Therefore, Allah mentioned their deeds for which they will deserve the, this punishment. As he says, indeed, they did not fear the reckoning. They did not fear a, rec a reckoning. That is, they did not believe in the resurrection, and they did not believe that Allah would requite people for both good and evil. So they failed to strive for the hereafter. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions at the beginning of Surah Al-Anbiya, اِقْتَرَبَ لِلنَّاسِ حِسَابُهُمْ The reckoning of people has drawn close. But most people are heedless of it. Some of the scholars said the reckoning is qiyamah, others said it is death. And both are similar in meaning because once you die, your qiyamah is established. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says this is the vast majority of people, they're heedless of it. So now on Yawm al-Qiyamah, Allah Azza wa Jal, why does he punish these people? One of the major reasons is because they didn't believe in qiyamah, they didn't prepare for that day. And they rejected our revelations outright. That is, they rejected them clearly and blatantly, and when clear proofs came to them, they stubbornly denied them. We have kept an account of all things, small and great, good and evil, in a book. That is, we have recorded it in a loh al-mahfud. So the evildoers should not be concerned that we will punish them for sins that they never did, or think that any of their deeds will go to waste, or that even an atom's weight of them will be forgotten. Will be forgotten. This is like the verse in which Allah subhanahu wa taala says. And the record of deeds will be placed in their hands, and you will see the evildoers filled with dread at what it, com at what it contains. They will say, woe to us, what sort of record is this? They leave no deed, small or great, unaccounted for. They will, find all they, uh, they will find all they did recorded there, and your Lord will not wrong anyone. This is the Loh al the account that Allah Azza wa keeps of every single person's record of deeds. Not a single thing, not even the smallest word, the smallest deed, the smallest action is missed therein. The Prophet said Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that a person will say a word, a word, and by it they will attain Allah's pleasure and His forgiveness. And a person will say a word, and they will attain by it Allah's wrath and His punishment. A word that you say. And look at how the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the hadith of Mu'adh radiallahu an said, O oh Mu'adh, shall I not tell you what controls everything, meaning your destination? He said, yes, O Messenger of Allah. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam held his tongue. He said this, Mu'adh said, O Messenger of Allah, are we going to be held to account for our words? He said, May your mother be bereaved of you, O Mu'adh. And what else will take people by their faces to be thrown into the fire? Except their words, except their statements, except what they say. Allah Azza wa will have every single word accounted for. And that is why the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, whoever believes in Allah on the last day, speak good or remain quiet. Every one of those words is being written. You have nothing good to say, don't say anything. Better for you in the sight of Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala. And that's why when the disbelievers, as Allah mentions, this verse that the author mentioned in Surah Al-Kahf, and they see their records of deeds, they will say, what type of record is this? Not the smallest thing, nor the biggest thing, except that it has been accounted therein. 
So taste, O oh disbelievers, this painful punishment and eternal requital, which shall not increase you in aught but torment. And at all times and every moment, their punishment will, will increase. This verse is the sternest of those verses that describe the severity of the punishment for the people of hell. May Allah protect us from it. <laughs> Verily, for the righteous, there will be salvation. <laughs> Gardens and vineyards. And youthful companions of equal age. And a cup that is full. They will not hear therein any vain talk or lies. A recompense from your Lord, a generous gift. From the Lord of the heavens and the earth and all that is between them, the most gracious whom they will have no power to address. Having described the situation of the evildoers, Allah now describes the destination of the righteous. As he says, verily, the righteous, verily for the righteous there will be salvation. That is, for those who fear the wrath of their Lord by consistently obeying him and refraining from that which he dislikes, there will be salvation and they will be kept far away from the fire. By virtue of that salvation, they will have gardens containing all kinds of trees, colorful and bearing fruit through which rivers run vineyards and grapevines are singled out for mention because of their high quality and abundance in those gardens. And there, will, and there they will have wives as they would like, youthful companions of equal age. That is, all close in age, usually people who are close in age, get along and are in harmony. The age in question is 33, which is the prime of youth. Now Allah Azza wa the Prophet ﷺ rather mentioned this, that the people of Jannah when they enter into Jannah will be at the age of their, of the age of their prime youth, and that is 33. That's mentioned in the hadith of Mu'adh ibn Jabal. It says 30 in one narration, 33 in the other narration. And Allah Azza wa Jal says in the verse before, gardens and vineyards. The author says, Allah Azza wa Jal often mentions anab, vineyards and grape vines because the Arabs used to love them. It was considered to be one of the most precious fruits and one of the most expensive fruits historically. Now, alhamdulillah, everything is easy. You can go to the local supermarket and you get grapes all times of the year. But in olden days, no, it was something which was very expensive. Grapes were expensive. And so only the elite, the nob nobility, the wealthy would take grapes, even in their wine and in their alcohol. As Anas radiallahu an says, that in the time of the Prophet sallam, in the Arabs, their alcohol was not made of grapes. They couldn't afford grapes. Where did grapes come to Mecca, Medina, and those areas from? They used to use barley and wheat and dates to make their alcohol because it was extremely expensive. So Allah Azza often in the Quran, when he speaks about his blessings in terms of the dunya and what Allah Azza gave to certain people in terms of wealth and on Yawm Al Qiyamah, what the people will have in terms of Jannah, Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala often mentions grapes because it is a sign that Allah will give to you the best, the most precious, the most valuable of all of His blessings. And a cup that is full, that is full of nectar, that is delicious for those who drink it. They will not hear therein any vain talk. That is talk in which there is no benefit or lies. That is sin. This is like the verse in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, they will not hear therein any vain talk or sinful speech, but only the salutation, peace, peace. Rather, Allah will give them this great reward by his grace and bounty as a recompense from your Lord to them, a generous gift. A generous gift. That is because of the good deeds that Allah enabled them to do and which he made uh, in which, uh, in which he made the price of admittance to paradise and its delights. The one who will bestow these gifts upon them is their Lord, the Lord of the heavens and the earth and all that is between them. That is, the one who created them and controls them, the most gracious, whose mercy encompasses all things. So he took care of them, had mercy on them, and showed kindness to them until they attained what they attained. <laughs> لا يتكلمون إلا من أذن له الرحمن وقال صوابا. On the day when the spirit Jibril 
and the angels stand in rows. None will speak except those to whom the most gracious gives permission, and they will say only what is right. That day is sure to come, so let him who will let him who will seek a way back to his Lord. Verily we have warned you of a punishment that is approaching The day when a man will see what his hands had wrought And the disbeliever will say Would that I were mere dust Then Allah mentions his greatness And mighty power on the day of resurrection And tells us that on that day All creatures will be silent and will not speak None will speak except those to whom the Most Gracious gives permission, and they will say only what is right. So no one will speak unless he meets these two conditions, that Allah has given him permission to speak, and that what he says is right. And that includes intercession, as we mentioned before, that even with intercession, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has to give permission to the one who's interceding, the one on whose behalf the intercession is being made, and the issue of intercession. If any one of those things are not pleasing to Allah, the intercession doesn't take place. So only those whom Allah allows can intercede. And they can only intercede on behalf of those upon whom Allah allows the intercession to take place. And the point of intercession also has to be approved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is because that day is, a tr is true and is sure to come. It is a day on which falsehood will never prosper and lying will be of no benefit. On that day, the spirit, namely Jibreel alayhi salam, who is the noblest of the angels, and the angels will stand in rows, submitting to Allah. None they will, will stand in rows. And Allah Azza mentions this a number of times in the Quran, that the angels, when they stand before their Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala, they stand in straight rows. And that is why the Prophet said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to the companions, when you not stand for the prayer, the way that the angels stand before their Lord. They said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, how do the angels stand before their Lord? He said that they make their rows straight. They make their roles straight. And that is why the Prophet ﷺ said, straighten your roles, for it is from the completeness of the prayer. And so on the day of judgment, they will come row upon row, as Allah Azza mentions elsewhere, Safa and Safa. They will come row upon row, coming to the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. None will speak any words except what Allah gives permission to say. After offering encouragement to strive for, fair, for, for paradise and mentioning frightening news of hell after giving glad, glad tidings and warnings Allah says so let him who will seek a way back to his Lord meaning, let, so let him who will seek a way back to his Lord meaning let, let him who wishes to <coughs> seek a way to Allah let him do so that is let him do righteous deeds so that he may return with that on the day of resurrection verily we have warned you of a punishment that is approaching the word translated here as approaching literally means near for everything that is approaching is near. The day when a man will come, uh, the day when a man will see what his hands had wrought, had wrought, that is, this is what will concern him and alarm him. So let him think about that in this world. This is like the verse in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, O you who believe, fear Allah, and let every soul consider what is has set forth for tomorrow. And fear Allah, for verily Allah is well aware of all that you do. And the Arabs say what their hands have wrought, because that is usually how actions are performed. It is your hands that do the majority of your deeds. But all of your limbs, as Allah Azza mentions, that your mouth, the mouths of the people of the fire will be sealed, and it will be their limbs that will testify upon them. Their hands, their feet, their bodies, they will testify as to what they did. Because Allah Azza wa when he will say to the people of the fire, which will you, who will you accept as a witness amongst you or upon you? Because the angels will testify, the prophets will testify, the believers will testify, and those disbelievers will say, no, we don't accept any of their testimonies. Who will you accept? Allah will ask. They said, we will only accept one that we trust. Allah says, what about if you testify against yourself? They will say, yes, so Allah, that we would accept. So Allah seals their mouths because they lie. And Allah will make their limbs testify. And Allah Azza mentions this elsewhere in the Quran. So when Allah allows them to speak again, they will say to their limbs, what did you testify against us for? Now we will all go into the fire. And their limbs will say, the one who gives power gave us power to speak. So we spoke as he allowed us to speak, meaning they only speak with the truth. If he finds that his, good, his deeds are good, 
then let him praise Allah. But if he finds otherwise, then uh, let, let him blame no one but himself. Hence the disbelievers will wish for death because of his, the intensity of their regret and remorse. We ask Allah to keep us safe from disbelief and all evil, for he is most generous, most kind. This is the end of the commentary of Surah al Naba. All praise and thanks are for Allah, and may the blessing and peace of Allah be upon the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, his family and his companions abundantly until the day of judgment. We now come to the 79th chapter of the Quran, Surah al naziat and it is known by this name in the narrations of the Sunnah and in the statements of the companions and the early works of Tafsir, Surah al naziat or One naziat and it is a Makki Surah according to the majority, if not all, of the scholars of Islam, as mentioned by Qurtubi, Ibn Atiyah, and others, and it consists of 46 verses. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم In the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful. والنازعات غرقا By those who rest violently. والناشطات نشطا By those who draw out gently. والسابق والسابحات سبحا And by those who glide swiftly. فالسابقات سبقا those who press forward as in a race. فَالْمُدَبِّرَاتِ أَمْرًا And who carry out the command of Allah. يَوْمَ تَرْجُفُ الرَّاجِفَةِ On the day when the earth is shaken violently by the first trumpet blast. تَتْبَعُهَا الرَّادِفَةِ Followed by the second trumpet blast. قُلُوبٌ يَوْمَئِذٍ وَاجِفَةِ on that day, hearts will be pounding. And eyes will be downcast. They say, will we really be restored to our former state? Even after we have turned into crumbling bones. قَالُوا تِلْكَ إِذًا كَرَّةٌ خَاسِرَةٌ They say, then if that is true, we would, need, we would indeed be losers. فَإِنَّمَا هِيَ زَجْرَةٌ وَاحِدَةٌ It will be but a single blast of the trumpet. فَإِذَا هُمْ بِالسَّاهِرَةٌ Then immediately they will, uh, they will, be, they will be back above ground. These oaths are sworn by the noble angels and their deeds which are indicative of their perfect submission to the command of Allah and their hastening to carry out his commands. It may be that what is attested to is the requital and the resurrection based on the fact that they are followed by a description of the resurrection. It may be that what is attested to and what is sworn by is one and the same and that Allah swears by the angels because belief in them is one of the six pillars of faith. What he means by this, the author Muhammad Ta'ala, in terms of what the subject is or what is being attested to, is that in the Arabic language, when you take an oath, there has to be a subject matter for which the oath is taken. You say, by Allah, and then what? Because it's not a complete sentence just to say, by Allah. By Allah, I will fast. By Allah, I will do this. By Allah, I won't do that. So when Allah Azza takes these oaths in the Quran by the angels, for what reason is he taking those oaths? Some other scholars said, to show to you the creation of the angels themselves. From the greatest of Allah's creations and the greatest of Allah's signs is the creation of the angels, how vast they are, how many they are, how they obey Allah Azza wa and submit to him. And others said, Allah Azza wa takes the oaths by the angels to speak about the reality of Yawm Al-Qiyamah and the resurrection because the verses that follow then speak about Yawm Al-Qiyamah. Moreover, mention of their deeds here refers to the requital of which the angels are in charge at the time of death and before and after that moment. And to Allah says, by those who rest violently, this refers to the angels who pull out souls forcefully and keep on pulling until the soul has been completely brought forth from the, bo from the body. Then it will be required for its deeds. And by those who draw out gently, this refers to angels who, pulls, who pull souls out gently. This indicates that gentle pulling out is for the souls of the believers. And violent resting is for the souls of the disbelievers. Look at how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given this ability to the angels by his command. And that is the extraction of the soul from the body. And this is mentioned in more detail in the hadith of Al-Bara ibn Azib radiallahu an. That the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa when he described the believer's soul leaving the body, he described it like a drop that comes out of a vessel. If you turn over a vessel, how easily does the drop of water leave it? That is how smoothly the soul of the believer will leave the body because it's going towards good 
and within a blink of an eye it is shrouded in the best of shrouds and it is perfumed with the best of perfumes and it is called by the best of names. And then when the Prophet ﷺ mentioned the disbeliever, he said it is like dragging a iron hook through a ball of, of wool that has been congealed together. It is extremely difficult to pull it through. And so it is dragged and dragged and dragged and he doesn't want to leave because that soul knows that once he leaves the body, it will be subject to the punishment that Allah Azza will give to it. So he hangs on and it is violently and painfully dragged out and then shrouded in the worst of shrouds and given the worst of stenches and odors and called by the worst of names. And by those who glide swiftly, that is who move through the air ascending and descending, those who press forward as in a race, hastening to fulfill the command of Allah and to outrun the devils when, they com when, when conveying revelation to the messengers of Allah, so that the, the latter will not eavesdrop on it. And who carry out the command of Allah. This refers to the angels whom Allah appoints to control many of the matters of the universe in both the upper and lower realms, such as rain, vegetation, trees, winds, seas, fetuses, animals, paradise, hell, and so on. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to all of these angels different jobs, different roles, different responsibilities. Some of the angels of Allah, they've only been created for his worship. That's all that they do. They only worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As the Prophet said, sallallahu alayhi wa that the heavens creak and they have the right to creak for there's not a hand span of space on it except that there is an angel standing in worship, bowing in worship, prostrating in worship to their Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then there are angels that have specific tasks, those that are coming to the souls, those to extract them, those that are the guardians of hellfire and the guardians of paradise, those that come to protect the believers, those that are in charge of the rain, those that are, that are, that are going to blow the trumpet. Allah Azza gives to each one of them roles that he has given to them, subhanahu wa ta'ala, each one by his permission. On the day when the earth is shaken violently by the first trumpet blast, which will signal the onset of the hour, followed by the second trumpet blast, on that day, hearts will be pounding. That is, they will be deeply troubled by the intensity of what they see and hear, and eyes will be downcast. That is, humbled and brought low, for fear will have seized their hearts, and they will be stunned by panic and overwhelmed with regret and sorrow. They, namely disbelievers in this world, say by way of denial, will we really be restored to our former state, even after we have turned into crumbling bones, that is, bones that are worn out and disintegrated. They say, then if that is true, we would indeed be losers. That is, they think it unlikely that Allah will resurrect them and recreate them after they have turned into crumbling bones. Out of ignorance of Allah's might and showing audacity and disrespect, disrespect towards him. Allah says, explaining how easy this is for him, it will be but a single blast for the, of the trumpet, whereupon all creatures will be back will be back above ground, that is, on the surface of the earth, standing and looking around, Allah will gather them and judge them and judge between them on the basis of his just rule, and he will requite them. Has there come to you the story of Musa? When his Lord called to him in the sacred valley of Tuwa, Idhaba ila firauna innahu ta'a Saying, go to Pharaoh, for he has indeed transgressed all bounds. Faqul hal laka ila anta zakka And say, are you willing to be purified? Wa ahdiyaka ila rabbika fatakhsha And for me to guide you to your Lord, so that you may come to fear him فأراه الآية الكبرى then Musa showed him the great sign فكذب وعصى but Pharaoh denied it and disobeyed ثم أدبر يسعى then he turned away and began scheming فحشر فنادى he gathered his people and made a proclamation فَقَالَ أَنَا رَبُّكُمُ الْأَعْلَى Saying, I am your Lord Most High. فَأَخَذَهُ اللَّهُ نَكَالَ الْآخِرَةِ وَالْأُولَى So Allah seized him for an exemplary, for an exemplary punishment in the hereafter and in this life. إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَعِبْرَةً لِمَنْ يَخْشَى Verily, in this there is a lesson for those who fear Allah. 
Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to his Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, has there come to you the story of Musa? This is a question about a matter of great significance that definitely happened. That is, has news come to you of him when his Lord came to him in the sacred valley of Tuwa? When his Lord called to him in the sacred valley of Tuwa. Tuwa is the place where Allah spoke to him, bestowed the, the message upon him, and chose him for his revelation and to bring him close to him. Tuwa is the valley, the mountain is a tur so Tawa is the valley in which the mountain is contained. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions both because both of them Allah Azza wa Jalla blessed. And as we mentioned before, that that is the place where the believers, when Ya'juj and Ma'juj emerge at the end of time, that Allah Azza wa Jalla will command the Prophet Isa alayhi salatu was salam to take the believers and go to Tawr and to seek refuge there until Allah Azza wa Jalla destroys the people of Ya'juj and Ma'juj. And this story of Musa alayhi salatu was salam, this is the final mention of it in the Quran. The story of Musa is the most repeated and extensively mentioned surah of a prophet of Allah in the book of Allah Azza wa Jalla. It begins from Surah Al-Baqarah and it continues throughout the Quran, mention of it over and over again. This is the final mention of it as a story. The name of Musa will come again, but as a story, this is the final mention. So from the beginning of the Quran towards the end of the Quran, the story of Musa is repeated. He said to him, go to Pharaoh, for he has indeed, he has indeed transgressed all bounds. That is, tell him to stop transgression polytheism and disobedience speaking to him gently so that perhaps he may pay heed, pay heed or fear Allah and say to him are you willing to be purified that is are you willing to attain some praiseworthy and good characteristics which people of understanding compete to attain which means purifying yourself from the filth of disbelief and transgression and attaining faith and doing righteous deeds and for me to guide you to your Lord that is show you the way to him and explain to you how you may attain his pleasure and avoid his wrath so that you may come to fear him when you come to know the straight path but Pharaoh rejected that to which Musa called him then Musa showed him the great sign this does not refer to one sign in particular because there are there were many signs so Musa threw down his staff and suddenly it was a serpent plain for all to see and he drew forth his hand and it appeared shining white to all the to all beholders Allah Azza wa Jalla says that Musa showed him the great sign and the author says it refers to all of the signs of Musa because in the Arabic language sometimes the singular is used to refer to a plural and the plural can be used to refer to a singular. So all of Allah Azza wa Jalla's signs, they come from him, they're like a single sign because all of them are from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Pharaoh denied and rejected all of them. But Pharaoh denied it, that is the truth and disobeyed the command. Then he turned away and began scheming. That is, striving to oppose, the f uh, and to oppose and fight the truth. He gathered his people and made a proclamation, saying to them, I am your Lord, Most High. So they submitted to him and affirmed his, false uh, his falsehood when he made fools of them. So Allah seized him for an exemplary punishment in the hereafter and in this life. That is, his punishment became a sign and a deterrent, a reminder of punishment in this world and the hereafter. He was given the worst of punishments in this world, and he will have the worst of punishments in the hereafter. And that is because of this claim that he made that I am your God and Lord. Many different prophets went to many different nations, but rarely did the people of those nations claim divinity for themselves. They were people of shirk. They used to worship their idols and their gods besides Allah, but they wouldn't claim to be God themselves. Pharaoh, he claimed to be God himself. He said, I am your God. I don't know of any God for you besides me. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him the worst of punishments because his evil was greater and his transgression was worse than those others who also disbelieved in Allah. Verily, in this there is a lesson for those who fear Allah. For the one who fears Allah is the one who will benefit from signs and lessons. When he sees the punishment of Pharaoh, he will realize that whoever is arrogant and, diso uh, and disobeys and opposes the sovereign most high, he will punish him in, the, in this world and the hereafter. As for the one whose heart is devoid of fear of Allah, no matter what signs what sign comes to him, he will not believe in it. Are you more difficult to create or the heaven? He built it. Raised its height and perfected it. He darkened its night and brought forth its daylight. And after that, he spread out the earth. Brought forth its water and its vegetation. 
والجبال أرساها and set the mountains firmly. متاع لكم ولأنعامكم as provision for you and your livestock. Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, giving a clear sign to those who disbelieve in the hereafter and think it unlikely that Allah those who disbelieve those who disbelieve in their resurrection and think it unlikely that Allah will recreate their bodies. Are you, O humans, more difficult to create or the heaven? With its immense size, strong structure, and great height, Allah built it, raised its height, that is, its size and shape, and perfected it with dazzling, astounding precision. He darkened its night so that its darkness env uh, envelops all parts of the heaven and the face of the earth is overshadowed, is overshadowed with darkness and brought forth its daylight. That is, he made a great light to prevail in it when he brings the sun during the day so that people may go about their business, both religious and worldly. And how many of our ibadat are based on the sun and the moon? the day and the night, when it comes to your fasting, when it comes to your hajj, when it comes to many of those acts of worship, you require the moon. But when it comes to your salah, you require the sun. It is the rising, rising and the setting of the sun that determines every single day when you pray and how you offer your salah. So Allah Azza makes them signs, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also makes them things that we use in terms of his worship subhanahu wa ta'ala. And after that, he spread out the earth. That is, after creating the heaven, he spread it out and deposited it, deposited it in, in it that which is beneficial for man. This is explained in the following two verses. Brought forth from it its water and its vegetation and set the mountains firmly. That is, he fixed them in the earth. And the spreading, of, the spreading out of the earth came after the creation of the heavens. As is stated in this passage, the one who created the mighty heavens and all that they contain of lights and heavenly bodies and the solid earth and all that it contains of necessities and that which benefits people will inevitably resurrect those who are accountable. Then he will requite them for their deeds. Whoever did good will have the best reward. And whoever did evil, let him blame no one but himself. Hence, after mentioning the resurrection, Allah mentions the requital and says, So when the greatest calamity comes, يَوْمَ يَتَذَكَّرُ الْإِنسَانُ مَا سَعَى On that day, man will remember all that he did. وَبُرِّزَتِ الْجَحِيمُ لِمَنْ يَرَى And the blazing fire will be exposed for all to see. فَأَمَّا مَنْ طَغَى Then as for the one who transgressed all bounds. وَآثَرَ الْحَيَاةَ الدُّنْيَا and, prefer, and preferred the life of this world. Verily, the blazing fire will be his abode. But as for the one who feared standing before his Lord and restrained himself from base desires, فَإِنَّ الْجَنَّةَ هِيَ الْمَأْوَى Verily, paradise will be his abode. That is, when the resurrection comes with great hardship that will make all other hardships pale in, into insignificance. At that time, a father will show no care for his son, nor a husband for his wife, nor any love for his beloved. On that day, man will remember all that he did in this world, both good and bad, and he will wish for an Adam's weight more of good deeds and he will feel regret and sorrow for the addition of even an Adam's weight to his bad deeds. And this is from the verses that shows something which some of the scholars mention and that is that on Yawm Al-Qiyamah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give to people perfect recall. They will remember everything that they did. So when they look at their deeds and look at them all, despite their vast number, if someone lives for 70, 80 years, how many actions will they perform? How many deeds will they perform? But when they see them in their record of deeds, they will recognize them and acknowledge them. And that is mentioned, that meaning is mentioned in a number of a hadith, like the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala will present someone with their deeds. They will recognize some, they won't recognize others. So they will say, oh Allah, these belong to me, but those do not belong to me. So Allah will say that those are the actions of your children and you get a share of that reward. A hadith like that, which shows that therefore people have good recall. They will remember because in the dunya you forget. What did you do yesterday? What did you do last week? Most of us don't remember what it is that we did, especially the small stuff, the mundane stuff, the everyday stuff, in terms of deeds and actions and sins. But on Yawm Al-Qiyamah, the people will acknowledge what they did.
because on that day there's no need for people to be weak or forget or to ignore rather they will know that which they did and they will acknowledge that before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at that time he will realize what will make him win or lose was efforts was his efforts in this world and all connections and relationships he had in this world will be severed nothing will be able to benefit him except righteous deeds and the blazing fire will be exposed for all to see that is it will be brought into few and made visible to everyone it will be made visible for his people for it has been prepared to ensnare them and is waiting for the command of its lord it is something which all of the people will see all of the people even the believers will see the fire and the prophet said sallallahu alaihi wasallam in the hadith that there is not a person of jannah who goes into jannah except that he will be shown his seat in the fire where you have to be entered into the fire Allah will show it to them. Had you been in the fire, this would have been your place. But Allah saved you from it so that they will understand the great mercy of Allah Azza wa Jalla and blessing upon them when they see the punishment that otherwise would have befallen them. And that is greater in terms of appreciating mercy. Someone who sees the opposite of that which they have understands its value. Someone becomes sick, they appreciate health. Someone becomes poor, they appreciate wealth. So likewise with the people of Jannah, this would have been your place. And in some wordings of the hadith, the same is done for the people of the fire. This would have been your place in paradise had you been from the believers and the righteous. So they will have greater remorse and regret when they see what the people of Jannah have that they have been denied. Then as for the one who transgressed all bounds, that is, he overstepped the mark by daring to commit major sins and he did not adhere to the limits set by Allah and preferred the life of this world to the hereafter. So his efforts were for the sake of this world and his time was spent in trying to accumulate worldly gains and pursue worldly desires. He forgot the hereafter and failed to strive for it. Verily, the blazing fire will be his abode. That is, it will be the final fate. It will be the fate and final abode of the one who is like this. But as for the one who feared standing before his Lord, that is, he feared being presented before him and being requited on the basis of justice, and that fear had an impact on his heart. So he forbade him to himself worldly desires that could cause him to drift away from obedience to Allah and his inclinations fell in line with that which the Messenger وسلم, brought, striving against whims and uh, physical desires that divert one from good. Look at how when Allah Azza wa Jalla describes the disbelievers, how does he describe them? As people who follow their desires. And then when Allah Azza wa Jalla describes the people of Iman and Taqwa, he describes them as being those who fear the standing before their Lord. And those two are therefore connected. So if you want to be someone who stays away from desires and the temptations of the dunya, then you should remember the akhirah often and death often. As the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, remember the destroyer of all pleasures, death. And so this is one of the greatest ways to remember and to refocus. That you always constantly remember the akhirah, constantly remember death, speak about the accounting and the day of judgment. And that's why, as we said before, surahs like this were often recited by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in salahs. Surahs that speak about judgment and paradise and hellfire. Because it is something which helps a person keep their desires in check. Verily, paradise with all that it contains of goodness, joy, and bliss will be his abode. That is, it is the abode of anyone who is like this. They ask you about the hour. When, when will it arrive? How could he possibly know that? Its knowledge rests with your Lord alone. You are but a warner for those who fear it. On the day they see it, it will be as if they had remained in this world no more than an afternoon of a day or the morning thereof. That is, those who stubbornly deny the resurrection ask you about the hour. When will it happen and when will it arrive? So Allah answered them by saying, how could you possibly know that? For there is no benefit for you or for them in knowing that and knowing when it will come. Because there is no religious or worldly benefit for people in knowing when the hour will come. Rather, the benefit is in its being hided it's being hidden from them knowledge of that has been withheld from all of creation and Allah has kept that knowledge to himself because if people knew when death would come 
when the akhirah would come, when the day of judgment would come, then they would know when to prepare for it and how to prepare for it. They would wait until that moment and then they would turn to Allah or the day before or a week before or a month or a year before. But Allah Azza wa has kept this hidden, kept this hidden from the people to see the sincerity of those who truly wish to attain the pleasure of Allah and the falseness of those who just make the claim but they don't really work for the akhirah. So Allah Azza wa has kept this hidden to see who, who will be truthful and who will be from other than the truthful. Therefore, he says, its knowledge rests with your Lord alone. That is, its knowledge is with him alone. As he says elsewhere, they ask you about the hour. When will it come to pass? Say, the knowledge thereof is with my Lord alone. None but he can, uh, can disclose when its time will come. It will weigh heavily on the heavens and the earth. It will not come upon you, but suddenly they ask you as if you were well informed of it. Say, the knowledge thereof is with Allah alone, but most people do not realize. You are but a warner for those who fear it. That is, the benefit of your warning is only for those who fear the coming of the hour and who fear the standing before Allah. They are the ones who do not care about anything except preparing for it and striving for it. As for the one who does not believe in it, no attention should be paid to him or to his stubbornness because his stubbornness is based on obstinacy and disbelief. If he has reached uh, such a state, answering his questions is pointless and the wise person should rise above that. This is the end of the commentary of Surah Al-Nazi'at. All praise and thanks are for Allah. And may the blessings and peace of Allah be upon Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his family and his companions abundantly until the Day of Judgment. And with that, we come to the end of the tafsir of Surah Al-Nazi'at and the end of today's lesson. Barakallahu feekum. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam.